Hello, welcome to another video from the first module of my new course on networking fundamentals. This module will teach you everything you need to know to understand how packets move through the internet. In this video, we will continue our discussion of the OSI model from a practical perspective. In the first part of this lesson, we unpacked how Layer 1, Layer 2, and Layer 3 contribute to the overall goal of networking. We discussed that Layer 1, the physical layer, was responsible for transporting ones and zeros across the wire. We then illustrated how if this host has some data needs to send to this host, it needs to start by adding a Layer 3 header, which will facilitate carrying the data from one end to the other. Then a new Layer 2 header will be added to carry the data from one hop to the next. This will continue across the entire path between these two hosts. If you haven't watched that video, go ahead and pause this video and watch that one first. There will be a link in the description. Otherwise, we will continue right where we left off by discussing Layer 4 of the OSI model, the transport layer. The overall goal of the transport layer of the OSI model is what I'm going to call service-to-service -service delivery. Let me explain what I mean by that. Here is a computer. This computer has an IP address and has a MAC address. In a pretty common scenario, whoever is using this computer has a web browser open and is browsing the web. But maybe at the same time, that user is also running some sort of chat program, something like Slack or Discord or IRC. And at the very same time, that user might also be running some sort of online game. Well, each of those programs is meant to send and receive data on the wire. All that data will be destined to this Layer 3 header to accomplish end-to-end -end delivery, and this Layer 2 header to accomplish hop-to-hop -hop delivery. The question then is how do we make sure the right program receives the right packets? Well, that's where Layer 4 comes into play. Layer 4 is there to distinguish data streams. It's going to take all that incoming data and make sure that the right program receives the right data. Just like Layer 3 had an addressing scheme to do end-to-end -end delivery, and Layer 2 had an addressing scheme to do hop-to-hop -hop delivery, Layer 4 is also going to be using its own addressing scheme to accomplish its goal of service-to-service -service delivery. Layer 4's addressing scheme involves ports. Now there are two sets of ports. There's 0 to 65,000 for TCP and 0 to 65,000 for UDP. TCP and UDP are two different strategies for distinguishing data streams. TCP favors reliability and UDP favors efficiency. Both TCP and UDP are simply different strategies for accomplishing the goal of layer 4. Their inner workings are both significant and fascinating, but unfortunately they are outside the scope of this lesson. They will both be covered in detail in a later lesson in this course. But the way they work is that every single program that's expected to receive or send data on the wire is going to be associated with a particular port number. Then when data arrives on the wire, it's going to include a layer 4 header in addition to the layer 3 and the layer 2 header that we've already discussed. That layer 4 header will indicate which particular program should be receiving that data, and that's what layer 4 is going to use to make sure the right program receives the right ones and zeros. So that's a high-level overview of how layer 4 distinguishes data streams. But let's pick it apart in more detail. Here is a client and three servers. As we discussed in the first lesson, a server is nothing more than a computer which is running software which knows how to respond to specific requests. Each of these pieces of software is assigned a predefined, well-known port number, which correlate to the underlying network application. Let's say Bank.com is listening for secure web request using HTTPS, which is assigned TCP port 443. And the server for site.com is responding to general web request using HTTP, which by default listens on TCP port 80. And this chat server is running IRC, which stands for Internet Relay Chat, which is an online chat application which runs on UDP port 6667. When the client is making a request to these servers, it's not only making a request to the IP address, it's also going to make a request to the specific port in question. Then, for each request made by the client, the client is going to choose a random port number to use as the source port for the connection. So a connection from our client to site.com would look like this. It includes a source port of 9999. That's the port that the client randomly selected for this particular connection. The destination of this packet is destined to the IP address of site.com going to TCP port 80, which is the HTTP application. Keep in mind 
that the source and destination IP addresses are going to exist in the layer 3 header of the packet, and the source and destination port are going to exist in the layer 4 header of the packet. Now, this randomly selected source port is actually very important. It is actually the port the client will listen to for the response to the original request. Meaning, when this server responds to this web request, that packet will look like this. Notice, the destination port is 9999. That's the same port that was initially selected by the client randomly on the outbound initial packet. So for all connections, there is always a source port and a destination port that are involved. The destination port is typically governed by the application in use, and the source port is randomly selected by the client. So our connection from the client to site.com has the following attributes. It is a TCP connection from this IP address and port to this IP address and port. Notice that in the initial packet, this was the source and this was the destination, and in the response packet, it's the exact opposite. This was the source and this was the destination. Now this process occurs for each connection made by the client. In each case, the client is selecting a new random source port. This makes it so that when all these servers respond, whatever comes back on port 8888 will be given to the web browser, and whatever comes back on port 7777 will be given to the IRC client. In this way, the data streams are kept isolated from each other. These ports will ensure that the right application gets the right data. This process also allows the client to make multiple connections to the same server. Consider when you are browsing the internet. I imagine you've often had multiple tabs open to the same website. Well, the reason each of those browser tabs don't accidentally display the data from another tab is that each time you open a new tab, your client, meaning your web browser, generates a new random source port. So that is how data streams are distinguished from one another. It is a function of UDP or TCP which are both layer four protocols. And again, layer four's ultimate goal is what I'm calling service to service delivery of data. Which finally brings us to the last three layers of the OSI model. Back when they first created the OSI model, each of these layers had a distinct function independent from the rest. However, currently, the distinction between these layers is somewhat vague. Every application is in fact free to implement the functions of layer five, six, and seven as they choose. Therefore, often, these three layers are simply considered as a single universal application layer. In fact, the other popular internet communication model actually does exactly that. The TCP IP model combines all the functions of the OSI layers 5, 6, and 7 into a single layer. Now, the goal of this module is to teach you how data flows through the internet, and the most critical layers to understand for that is layers 1 through 4. Therefore, we aren't going to pick apart the original intended distinction between layers 5, 6, and 7. If you're curious, however, go ahead and let me know in the comments below, and I can cover it in another video. As for us, we're going to follow the TCP IP model's lead and simply consider all three of these layers as the application. So now that we've talked through the entire OSI model, I want to show you what's actually happening when hosts are communicating to each other using this networking stack. This host has an application that's going to generate data that is meant to be sent to the other side. What that host is going to go through is what's known as the encapsulation process. That data will be first sent to layer four. Layer four is going to add a header to that data, which is going to facilitate the goal of layer four, which is service to service delivery. In this case, it is a TCP header, which is going to include the source port and destination port for this particular data. The construct of a layer four header plus data is known as a segment. That segment is going to be passed down the OSI stack to the next layer, in this case, layer three, the network layer. And the network layer is going to add another header to this data. This header is going to facilitate the goal of layer three, which is end-to-end -end delivery. Meaning in this header, you'll have something like a source IP address and a destination IP address. The construct of a layer three header and its data is known as a packet. Now notice that inside the data of the packet is the layer four header that was above it. But from layer three's perspective, it doesn't know or doesn't care what's inside that data. It's simply a bunch of ones and zeros that need to be delivered to the other end. Either way, layer three will then take that packet and hand it off to layer two. And layer two will once again add another header to that data, 
to accomplish Layer 2's goal of hop-to-hop -hop delivery, meaning this header will include something like a source MAC address and a destination MAC address. The construct of a Layer 2 header and its ensuing data is known as a frame, and that frame gets converted into ones and zeros and finally put on the wire. On the other side, the receiving host is going to do the opposite process. It's going to do de-encapsulation, meaning it's going to take those ones and zeros off the wire to convert them back into their frame. Layer 2 is going to look at the Layer 2 header to make sure that it is indeed addressed to this host's NIC. If it is, it's going to discard that header and pass that up the stack. Then Layer 3 is going to look at the IP header to confirm it is indeed addressed to this host's IP address. If it is, it's going to discard that Layer 3 header and pass it up the stack to the transport layer. Layer 4 will then take a look at the Layer 4 header to identify the port that this data is destined to and will deliver the data to the appropriate application. And the application can then finally process the data. That is the process of encapsulation and de-encapsulation. Notice each layer is going to add information to the data in order to accomplish its goal. And this brings us to the final idea I want to communicate to you about the OSI model. Throughout this lesson, we've mentioned that networking devices operate at specific layers. For example, switches and routers operate at layer 2 and layer 3, respectively. What that means is that they only look into the datagram up to their respective layer. For example, switches, which are layer 2 devices, are only looking at the frame, meaning they're only looking at the layer 2 header to make a decision. They're not looking inside the data payload into the layer 3 and layer 4 headers, which we know exist there. They're only looking up to the layer 2 header. Moreover, we've discussed that there are various protocols which operate at specific layers. For instance, the IP protocol is a layer 3 protocol. TCP and UDP are layer 4 protocols. That said, neither of these are strict rules. There are exceptions to each of these that exist. For example, if you take a router which typically operates at layer 3, but configure access list on that router, now that router is looking into the layer 4 header to make a decision. So the router isn't purely a layer 3 device anymore. Moreover, earlier in this lesson we discussed the ARP protocol, and we discussed how ARP links a layer 2 address to a layer 3 address, links an IP address to a MAC address which means ARP doesn't purely fit in layer 3, nor does it purely fit in layer 2. The point I'm trying to make is that the OSI model is simply a model. It's not rigid rules that everything in networking adheres to. It's simply a way to conceptualize what is required for data to flow through the internet. And that wraps up our lesson on the OSI model. The main takeaway for this lesson is understanding that each layer of the OSI model has a specific function that contributes to the overall goal allowing two hosts to share data with one another. Each layer uses its own addressing scheme to accomplish their various goals. And finally, there are various devices and protocols which operate at specific layers of the OSI model, which serve in accomplishing each layer's goal, but do keep in mind exceptions do exist. In the next lesson, we'll be looking at everything a host does to put data on the wire. But that's it for this lesson. I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching. And we'll see you in the next lesson when we discuss everything a host does when communicating on the internet. Hey YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that free lesson for my new course on networking fundamentals. I'll be releasing the entire first module for free here on YouTube. I want this course to be the ultimate networking fundamentals course. And since I'm still scoping out the outline, you could have a say in what topics will be covered. Let me know in the comments below what subjects you want included in this course. Otherwise, remember to like and subscribe. And of course, if you learned something from this video, the best way to thank me is to share this video. It's a small act of gratitude, but one I appreciate greatly. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.